uh, start. So today uh, we uh, we have Meg Tusinski here. Meg is um, an assistant director at the Bridwell Institute for Economic Freedom. She's also research assistant professor with the Bridwell Institute at uh, Southern uh, Methodist University. She is a graduate of George Mason. She has a PhD from uh, George Mason, master's and uh, an undergrad degree um, from, um, from George Mason. So you might know Meg from her work on the Economic Freedom Index. Uh, that's uh, one of her areas of focus now, but she has also done extensive research on uh, entangled political economy. Um, one of her papers can be uh, co-authored with it, can be found in public choice. It's uh, from mixed uh, economy to entangled political economy. It's a very interesting piece. Anyway, uh, please join me in wel welcoming Meg to Epern. Hi. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Marta. And uh, since you're actually Polish, you didn't have to ask how to pronounce my last name. That's uh, not common. <laughs> I looked up the, I just looked up how to do it in English, but I don't know. I mean, Tuszynski is the proper one, but I, I don't expect anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I usually just say Tuszynski. Uh, so uh, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for, for being here today and to accommodating the change. A, a couple weeks ago, we were, as I'm sure you all saw, experiencing uh, what did not turn out to be rolling blackouts, extensive blackouts in in Texas and snow, and it's a beautiful uh, 63 degree sunny day in, in Texas today. So we have we have bizarre weather here. Um, but uh, today I'm here discussing a paper. I'm I'm really excited to uh, talk about with with this particular group on uh, fitting the third sector into the entangled political economy framework. Uh, here we go. So. It's not really a clear cut answer what the relationship is, even within the literature, between commercial enterprises, nonprofit enterprises, and, and government enterprises. There are a variety of different ways that different scholars have, have thought about this complicated set of relationships. Um, so we have, you know, wise broad with, with one, uh, you know, set of ideas that when uh, both markets and governments fail, nonprofits step in to, to fill the void. Um, we have Cornel, uh, Cor Cornell, um, I always have to, to go back and, and think how to pronounce that, um, saying that, that nonprofits can actually act as competitors to, to similar sorts of government enterprises. Uh, we have Salomon with a, a very different set of ideas that uh, nonprofits and government enterprises uh, actually work best together when they're strong complements, when there's strong um, maybe entanglement uh, between, between nonprofit and government enterprises, or uh, at least close relationships between nonprofit and government enterprises. Uh, very recently, uh, Zoltan Axe has, said, uh, has a book on um, how partnerships between government organizations and nonprofit organizations can help alleviate market failure and encourage innovation. And this is just a, a smattering of a very large set of ideas on, on these sorts of complicated relationship between these three different sectors. I think a natural question to ask at this, ask at this point is, well, why, why do we care? Why is it important to fit nonprofits into a conversation or into the broader framework of, of entanglement? Um, and, and I think this relationship does, understanding this complicated relationship really does matter. Um, you know, most importantly, as, as many in sort of the Austrian tradition have pointed out, we care whether resources are going to their most highly valued uses. And since nonprofits, uh, as, as some argue, are, are unable to engage in something like economic calculation, we'll debate how, how true that is later, um, you know, it's, it's uncertain uh, whether the resources that are being used by nonprofits are really being used in the most efficient manner. So even you know, Becky and Coyne and Prochitko, who are our uh, champions of, of the nonprofit sector and Alajika, um, you know, are a little bit skeptical as to the ability of nonprofits to engage in something like economic uh, calculation. Um, and if they can't engage in economic calculation, then there's no way to really understand whether the resources they're using are being used in the most efficient uh, manner. Um, but Others, like Emily Wright, um, sort of, I think, um, maybe most comprehensively, but, you know, Storr and Hoffley Ball, uh, uh, Stephanie Hoffley, um, have argued that, in fact, nonprofits do have some good analogs um, to, to market signals. There are some, um, you know, uh, uh, competition for donor dollars and reputational mechanisms and things like this that, that are, 
signals that nonprofit actors can use to determine whether uh, they're, they're using resources efficiently or effectively. Um, and so understanding how nonprofits relate to both government enterprises and commercial enterprises sort of helps us understand these sorts of questions in a broader way as well. So a lot of the current literature, um, particularly in, in the, uh, but not exclusively in sort of the Austrian uh, you know, realm, tends to put nonprofits in sort of a public private uh, spectrum or continuum. Um, and and I, I sort of argue in the paper, this is an, an additive framework. We're talking in the language of entangled political economy. It uses the additive framework to, to understand um, the relative efficacy of different nonprofit organizations. And so those organizations that lie relatively closer to the private or, or commercial end of the spectrum tend to be more effective and more able to rely on, on price-like mechanisms um, for engaging in calculation and coordination. And those that are closer to the public end of the spectrum or continuing continuum are, are unable to uh, take advantage of, of local knowledge and engage in something like economic calculation. Um, and so some, as we say, like Sal Salman, see it as desirable to be closer to that public government end of the spectrum. Some like Chamley Wright and, and Storr and Stephanie Hoffley see it as, as desirable to be closer to the private market side. And this is a really useful distinction. I'm not, uh, not sort of pushing back against the, the usefulness of that distinction for some questions. Um, but I think understanding nonprofits in an entangled framework can help us probe other sorts of dynamics and answer other sorts of questions about nonprofit organizations and understand the whole ecology of enterprises a little bit uh, more robustly. Uh, and as I say here, the ecology of nonprofit enterprises is, is a little bit more complicated than the, this continuum framework would suggest. You know, we have uh, uh, nonprofit organizations that are very closely related to, to local or, or state government entities that tend to function very effectively. And we have some pri nominally private nonprofit organizations that are still highly bureaucratic, like the, the Red Cross, pretty famously, and tend not to, to be able to rely on price signals or cultivate local knowledge as effectively. And so for these reasons, I think understanding nonprofits in an entangled framework is really important. So I, I kind of touched on this already. I'll be very brief here uh, in a, a uh, network that is already um, very well versed on understanding what entanglement is. Um, but as, as Wagner says in various places, entanglement treats both polities and economies as interrelated orders of, of interacting agents. Uh, there's, there's no government that's intervening into some ideal type of a market economy, no pure market economy that's doing really well until government agents or government actors come in and, and disrupt the orderly workings of the market economy. If we look at the ecology of, of enterprises, there are, uh, there are all sorts of interlapping, uh, overarching, uh, interlapping, uh, Oh, that's not a word, uh, um, overlapping, interacting sorts of, of agents. Um, markets and governments are, are comprised as this ecology of overlapping enterprises. It's hard to even point to an enterprise, uh, you can point to some, but point to an enterprise and say that is an example of a purely private enterprise. Uh, in the um, uh, market for, I think I have a, a quote on this later, but Wagner has a great passage in, in um, Politics as a Peculiar Business talking about the market for cars. Uh, and we tend to think that that's, that's pretty close to an ideal type of a um, really commercial enterprise. But once we sort of think about all of the political influences in the car market, not just the market itself, but in the different components that go into a vehicle and uh, fuel standards and things like this, it's, it's really hard to say um, that, that that's an, an ideal type of a market enterprise. Um, so I will say to his credit, um, Wagner completely recognizes, um, of course he does, that, that it, the entanglement framework can encompass the third sector. Um, he has a, a lovely set of, of uh, uh, passages in Politics as a Peculiar Business where he talks about civil society. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, explicitly says that this framework can encompass civil society type organizations. He says the institutional arrangements of actual societies are far richer than the common public private dichotomy portrays. Uh, but um, this, he doesn't elaborate on this at, at length uh, in, in his book for, for obvious reasons. That's not what the book is about. Um, but here, what I'm, I'm doing is sort of elaborating on the notion of how and where we can fit uh, third sector type organizations, nonprofit organizations into the entanglement framework. And I will say, I, I kind of use third sector and nonprofit uh, enterprises interchangeably. Um, I, I understand that the literature treats these differently in some contexts, but since I'm talking about a whole ecology of enterprises where the boundaries are a little bit fluid, um, I don't see it as particularly problematic to uh, use those, those terms as interchangeable. Uh, if anyone disagrees, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear that though. So in uh, the, the paper that Marta brought up in the beginning and that, that uh, uh, Wagner and I wrote back in 2015, um, we explicitly looked at how entangled political economy differed from standard notions of interventionism. And I think this idea is, is also important for understanding the, the question at hand today. Um, so, you know, the theories of interventionism as put forth by Mises and Akita uh, kind of take as the starting point a market and we have political forces intervening into an, the otherwise relatively orderly workings of, of markets. Um, that's not to say that markets don't fail in all of these things, um, but we have the, 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 we're working within this additive notion of political economy. This, this in interventionism framework is working with an additive notion of, of political economy um, as, as opposed to the entangled notion. Uh, and so if I'm pushing back against sort of additive notions of, um, uh, of the relative efficacy of different types of nonprofit organizations, I think this uh, framework is, is, is really, um, really pertinent to the discussion. So in that paper, we drew on uh, Pareto's distinction between logical and non-logical action and argued that the Pareto's distinction uh, really helped us better understand the dynamics of entangled systems in a more robust way. And so within Pareto's framework, logical action pertains primarily to the realm of experience goods. And this means that outcomes can logically be tested against the claims that are made. And so within the realm of commercial enterprises, we can, we can directly test whether, you know, the, the experience of the sandwich that I had from Jersey Mike's today lived up to the claims that were made about how good a Jersey Mike sandwich is. Um, you know, in the paper, I use the example of uh, Theranos or, or however you pronounce that, the, the blood testing company. The, uh, they made some, some amazingly um, uh, big claims about how good their, their you know, blood testing technology was. And the company completely imploded once it was discovered that the, uh, the outcomes did not sort of weren't logically related to the, the claims that were made. Um, now I say there are important uh, entanglement caveats here. And by that, I mean, uh, so, so log as I say, logical action pertains primarily to experienced goods and uh, commercial activity fits really well into this logical framework. Uh, you know, people quit patronizing commercial enterprises where the outcomes don't sort of correspond to the, the claims that were made about that good or that service. However, uh, if we think about uh, uh, experienced goods existing within an entangled framework, uh, goods and services of all types existing within an entangled framework rather than a pure market framework, there are all sorts of organizations that we can think about that can persist for a long time uh, even when the, the outcomes don't really correspond closely to the claims that are made about that good. If there's uh, subsidies or other types of political support, um, you know, Amtrak uh, is, is another great example that, that Wagner discusses in his book, uh, even when the outcomes don't really uh, uh, directly correspond to the claims that were made about that good, if there's significant entanglement, uh, 
uh, those sorts of organizations can, can limp along for a long time. So it's important when discussing logical action to really be clear that yes, it does pertain to the realm of the commercial, but if we're in an entangled framework, the realm of commercial goods uh, is, is not always as, as clear cut as textbooks would make it out to be. Um, I, this sort of uh, caveat will become important when we're discussing the nonprofit sector. Uh, Non-logical action pertains primarily to, to credence goods. So the outcomes can't easily be tested against the claims that were made. A lot of our political discourse falls into this realm of non-logical action. People can make all sorts of claims about how good a particular program or public works project or whatever it is are good for society in some way. And it's not really easy to say yes or no. Um, so the example I use in the paper is, is WIC, the Women, Infants and Children program. Uh, it, it provides, uh, you know, food and formula and things like that to, to mothers who can't afford these things on their own. Definitely provides, uh, provides valuable services to these mothers. Um, but it's, it's unclear whether the, these resources are going to their most highly valued use. Um, and so, you know, even if that program were, and I don't know, I haven't looked into it, but even if that program were hemorrhaging money, and we could think of a better way to provide these sorts of services, that program is so popular based on these sort of non-logical feel-good sorts of uh, reasons um, that, that it uh, is unlikely that it would disappear even if it were, were phenomenally, uh, you know, um, I don't wanna say ineffective, but, but uh, diverting resources at, at a large scale. So the question then becomes, are nonprofits characterized primarily by logical action? Um, uh, do they fit primarily into this um, uh, category of, of experience goods or by non-logical action? Do they fit largely into this category of credence goods? And it's, it's not really a clear cut answer. I think we can see with different sorts of nonprofits elements of both of these with some nonprofits the the sort of more uh, credence non-logical action taking, taking uh, you know, the forefront um, and with other types of nonprofits, sort of the logical action, um, you know, exerting uh, significant amounts of, of discipline. So nonprofit services aren't sold directly in a market. So they lack those direct feedback mechanisms that characterize logical action. And I have a whole separate uh, discussion of, of economic calculation but the economic calculation argument fits. Uh, since nonprofit services aren't sold on a market, that direct feedback loop that is provided by by market goods and service to market goods and services, uh, you know, isn't really providing the same sort of discipline to the goods and services that are provided by nonprofits. However. Chamley Wright and, and many others uh, detail ways in which nonprofits actually provide superior services to, to similar government enterprises. Uh, so uh, there, there are some ways in which some nonprofits uh, outperform similar government enterprises. And so that would suggest that, you know, they, they are maybe more, some, some nonprofits are more disciplined by this sort of logical uh, action um, uh, relative to other nonprofits or, or other similar government enterprises. Some nonprofits absolutely can remain in business by appealing to, to donor sentiment, by writing really good, I mean, I, I think many of us have, have participated in, in different nonprofits before, and writing really good donor reports is, is really important. Appealing to that donor sentiment is really important. And it's undoubtedly the case that some nonprofits can remain in business if they're able to, you know, employ people that that uh, that can write reports that pull at the heartstrings of their donors. But long-term success generally depends on producing some sorts of, of concrete results. Uh, you know, a nonprofit that only pulls at the heartstrings without producing tangible results. Uh, is, is not likely to stay in business for long. Some will, uh, but, but that doesn't, is probably not the modal uh, nonprofit. Um, I think a key point here 
and, and a key point for understanding nonprofits within sort of the framework of entanglement is that the, even the term nonprofit sector covers a really, really diverse ecology of enterprises. And so uh, when we're making sense of, well, are nonprofits characterized by logical or non-logical action? You can't just look at nonprofits as a sector and say they are characterized by this or these are the characteristics of nonprofit you know, enterprises. There are all sorts of different nonprofit enterprises that are, are entangled in different ways with commercial actors and uh, government actors. And so understanding that whole ecology is, is really important and admittedly makes this conversation and makes my, my whole research project kind of complicated. Um, but but as, as I say in the introduction of my paper and in my summary slide here, I'm primarily interested in this paper and starting the conversation of how we incorporate the sector into, uh, into the entanglement framework. There are a lot of complicated issues to work out, um, particularly because the nonprofit sector is so diverse. Um, but but uh, what I'm doing here is, is very modestly just, just starting the conversation, I think. So as I say, there are all sorts of different institutional arrangements, even within the nonprofit sector. And, and I think Wagner's discussion of malls versus cities is really important for thinking about the nonprofit sector as well. So he has this, this lovely little discussion uh, on the, how both malls and cities provide all sorts of different types of public goods. Uh, you know, some of the better malls in the US provide different like, trolley systems throughout the mall. Uh, you know, uh, if you go down, I, I know, Many of you have made a stop or, or currently reside in the DC area. If you go down to Old Town Alexandria, there's a lovely little trolley system that can take you around. Um, but malls and cities have different sorts of, of capital accounts, which sort of provide different sorts of, of disciplining mechanism to malls and to cities. And so he says, in thinking about hotels and cities in this manner, it becomes quickly clear that the governance qualities of different institutional arrangements are of far greater significance than assertions about what is or is not a public good. So if the boundaries between markets and, and governments are blurry, <clears throat> it's important to clearly understand the institutional characteristics uh, that, that lead to better and worse um, provision in, in the nonprofit sector. The, the boundaries between the nonprofit sector governments and, and the commercial sector are really, really blurry, but the capital accounts of different types of nonprofit organizations differ pretty dramatically. And so I think there's a key there in understanding the relative efficacy of, of different types of institutional arrangements. And, and this is absolutely, and the reason I use sort of the Ostromian phrase in, in titling my paper is this is absolutely what, what Eleanor Ostrom was getting at in, in um, you know, a huge chunk of her research understanding that the design characteristics of different types of organizations is really, really important and helping understand the efficacy of various different types of, of organizations. And, you know, it, it may be the case that some organizations that are closer to, to or that, that have significant relationships with government actors will outperform some nominally uh, market organizations. It's those institutional characteristics that, uh, that, that make different sorts of enterprises more or less effective. Uh, one of the most important institutional uh, characteristics for the nonprofit sector and for the long-term success of, of any nonprofit organization is understanding how economic calculation or uh, sort of how coordination um, occurs in this sector. And that's, that's what I'll turn to next here. So the, the next question is whether nonprofits can engage in rational economic calculation. And again, Becky and Coyne and Brachitko are not, are not uh, you know, opponents of, of nonprofit organizations, but they do have some really uh, crucial questions that they ask about uh, how well nonprofits are able to engage in the sort of uh, economic calculation that would lead to uh, broader scale economic coordination. And they make a very persuasive argument that nonprofits lack resource recourse to the profit and loss mechanism 
And therefore, it's really unclear whether the resources that they use are going to their, their most highly valued uses. Um, you know, without recourse to, to this um, profit and loss mechanism, uh, it's, it's really unclear, even if nonprofits are doing things that, that most people look at and say are good, this, this doesn't mean that nonprofits shouldn't be doing these things, but that there are some real questions as to whether uh, nonprofits are doing these things efficiently or effectively, or if there would be a better alternative arrangement for providing these sorts of goods and services. Chanley Wright, in a, in a direct sort of refutation article to the, the Becky and Pritko 2004 article, says that even though the Austrian understanding of economic calculation is indeed an important concept, if we were to understand better the philanthropic process, the Austrian concepts of non-monetary discovery and the cultivation of local knowledge are equally relevant, if not more so. And the, the emphasis there was, was added by me. Um, but if we're looking at uh, you know, profit and loss as potentially being problematic, maybe a better question to ask is whether um, nonprofit organizations are able to engage in non-monetary discovery, and if they're able to effectively cultivate the local knowledge that they need to be effective service providers. Um, these seem to be, be at least equally um, relevant questions for understanding the relative efficacy of various nonprofit organizations. She makes a, the, the further argument that state organizations can't engage in calculation and can't easily access this, this local knowledge that is so important for uh, providing valuable goods and services to the intended populations. And so in that way, nonprofits, even if they lack the, the really strong um, economic calculation that, that market organizations have, they definitely have an edge over state organizations that are unable to, to even perform these sort of basic things they would need to determine whether they're providing uh, valuable goods and services to their intended populations. So effective nonprofits uh, make use of local knowledge and have ways, according to Chamley Wright, to engage in important discovery processes. Um, some of the, the most important sort of disciplinary mechanisms available to nonprofits are competition for donor dollars. There are only so many, you know, donors have tons and tons of different nonprofits that they can choose from. Uh, and so maintaining those, those gifts and grants year after year um, in, entails a, a competitive process. And nonprofits are, are also disciplined by, by a reputational discipline. If you, if you lose your reputation, you're not going to continue receiving those donor dollars in the future. Nonprofits therefore are responding to competitive forces in some way. They're just different types of competitive forces than, than characterize commercial enterprises. However, if we're putting this now into an entangled framework, so, so Chamley Wright was kind of interested in, in others. Again, I keep mentioning like Storr and, and Hoffley, um, our, our and Myers are, are interested in understanding um, how nonprofits perform relative to similar government enterprises and how they perform relative to, to commercial enterprises, but they're still working when, within this sort of additive notion of political economy. And uh, that, that sort of, um, there's, there's an implicit argument in a lot of these papers that if a nonprofit is located closer to the commercial end of the spectrum, this, this hypothetical spectrum, then it's, it's, uh, it is subject to more of these disciplining mechanisms that make markets work so well. Um, however, high levels of entanglement with, as I say, political system make these disciplinary mechanisms weaker and, and make the, these feedback mechanisms less effective. Um, but uh, I think it's the next slide here. Um, uh, maybe the following slide, yeah. So um, I, I'll say my, my entanglement discussion for the following slide. Um, even for profit, so, you know, Chamley Wright and, and others are saying that those more closely connected to their target populations and those who do have some, you know, price-like signals they can rely on will be relatively more effective in providing uh, valuable goods and services to their nonprofit consumers. And even for for-profits, in price signals are, are just that, they're signals. They're not directives for, for action. 
Um, so even for-profit enterprises have to engage in, in some interpretation of the sorts of feedback loops, the feedback signals that they're sent in determining how to act. So even if nonprofit actors don't have true price signals, they still have feedback that, that they are acting on in determining how to proceed in the future. They're still rationally responding to the signals that they're being confronted with. Um, there's absolutely, and this is again, I'm just building on Chamley Wright a lot in this sector uh, section. There's no guarantee that nonprofit organizations will be able to calculate useful local knowledge that allows for, for decision making. But she says there's, there's really no reason why we should expect system wide failure either. So she says uh, earlier, government organizations are not able to calculate this, this sort of relevant local knowledge and not able to easily engage in, in non-monetary decision-making. Not all nonprofits are going to be equally effective at doing this, but there's no reason, she says, why we should expect them to systematically fail at, at doing these things either. And now as I promised, pulling back in this, this entanglement notion. The entanglement framework makes interpreting even market price signals a little bit more complicated or significantly more complicated in some cases than sort of the textbook treatment of, of um, the sort of profit and loss and, and price mechanisms uh, assume. So in ideal markets, prices send signals and, and entrepreneurs and in commercial enterprises act on those signals. But if in many markets uh, and in many market enterprises are characterized by some level of entanglement, then these signals aren't quite as reliable as the sort of textbook treatment of price signals would suggest. And so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Wagner says, as a formal matter, we speak of a market for cars. As a substantive matter, however, it's a different market for cars in the presence of public ordering than when that market is governed through private ordering alone. And so car manufacturers are still confronted with, with price signals. Um, and, and have to you know, respond on the basis of those different sorts of price signals. Um, but there's a little bit of interpretation that has to go on. So they're not directives for action. And there are significant subsidies and other sorts of incentives that exist in the, the car manufacturing sector that make those signals less reliable than the textbook treatment of price signals would suggest. However, Despite political influence being omnipresent in a variety of different sorts of markets, market prices are still useful for engaging in economic calculation. And so if that's the case, if we can rely on market prices for rational economic calculation in other sorts of, of market sectors, um, even market sectors with, with you know, varying levels of, of uh, entanglement with political actors, um, maybe the calculation problem problems for nonprofits are a little bit overstated. If, if the calculation problem in the market sector is not as clear cut as textbook treatments would have you believe, then the calculation problems for nonprofits um, are, are a little bit overstated. It's a little bit, it's not quite as, as problematic if they're not engaging in pure rational economic calculation, if a lot of market actors are also not engaging in pure rational economic calculation, if entanglement indeed does characterize large portions of, of the, the sort of uh, institutional landscape. So Chamley Wright suggests, and, and I'm inclined to agree that we should pay closer attention to how nonprofits engage in non-monetary calculation. Again, they're still responding to some sorts of signals, even if they're not as clear as textbook price signals and how they're able to cultivate local knowledge. Because by cultivating local knowledge, you're better able to serve your target populations and do the things that, uh, that they need you to, to be doing with, with your nonprofits. Um, she, again, argues that state-owned enterprises are systematically incapable of engaging in either monetary calculation or calcula uh, cultivating local knowledge but that there's no reason that we should assume that nonprofit organizations systematically fail in this area. So if we use this ecology of enterprises uh, uh, sort of um, terminology, rather than looking at the nonprofit sector and analyzing how the nonprofit sector functions, 
we can examine the institutional characteristics that, that lead to relative success. And again, I think understanding the nonprofit sector within the entanglement framework helps us understand characteristics that, that thinking about nonprofits as falling somewhere on a spectrum of profit, public to private um, sort of misses. Here's a point that I've been, been thinking about in, in the last couple of weeks that's not in the paper, but um, that I, I just wanted to kind of discuss maybe a little bit more fully with this crowd, if you're interested in, in picking up this line of discussion. So in the paper, I said that both highly bureaucratic nonprofits and nonprofits that are really entangled with state actors would be unable to take advantage of non-monetary calculation and, and local knowledge. But that's only looking at entanglement in one direction. So if I'm looking at nonprofits as existing in this whole ecology of enterprises, it seems likely, and, 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 and an argument that, that sort of progressives make, um, that high levels of entanglement with businesses could in some cases be equally problematic. Um, and, and what really sparked my thought in this direction was, was uh, I assigned Friedman's 1970 um, discussion uh, about uh, sort of corporate social responsibility in, in one of my classes. And all those discussions sort of got me thinking, well, well, these students are all really concerned, Friedman's really concerned about corporate social responsibility and, and the sort of flawed signals that corporate social responsibility campaigns can send. And, and I think people progress, the progressive persuasion and others who are concerned with um, businesses being really entangled in the nonprofit sector, there, there are equally valid concerns about businesses being overly influential in the nonprofit sector, as the, are the concerns of governments entities being, being overly entangled in the nonprofit sector. And so I think if I'm thinking about nonprofits in this entangled framework, thinking about entanglement in both directions is important. Um, I I'm, I'm, don't really want to, to get partisan. I don't really enjoy, you know, politics all that much. But, um, you know, progressives are really concerned with the entanglement coming from the business side. You know, Republicans are really concerned about entanglement coming from the, the, the government side. And I think both arguments are, are valid and there are reasons to be concerned um, uh, about entanglement coming from both directions. And so that's something I'd like to, to sort of um, think through a little bit more and, and perhaps incorporate into the next draft of the paper. And so because I want to leave uh, you know, plenty of time for discussion here, um, I'll, I'll conclude at this point. So as I've said a number of times throughout my talk, I'm just starting the conversation, and, and this paper is, is, has a really modest aim of starting the conversation about how to think about nonprofits in an entangled framework rather than on a spectrum of, of public to private. Um, I, I really think that last point, which wasn't in the paper about entanglement with private enterprise is important for thinking about nonprofits in an entangled framework. And so, you know, that's sort of a next step that, that didn't occur to me until recently to, to pursue, but I think is really important in understanding the full ecology of enterprises of nonprofits and where, uh, where this sorts of entanglement can become problematic. Um, I, I also, and I did mention this in the paper, you know, I, I do want to incorporate a case study um, you know, the, not, the Red Cross, I think, is a, a reasonable, um, you know, case study to incorporate a large bureaucratic nonprofit that's become increasingly enmeshed with government entities um, over the years. Um, but I, I would also welcome any suggestions anyone has for sort of nonprofit commercial sector entanglement, um, because the more I think about it, the more I think that will become important for my argument. Uh, and maybe in a separate paper, but, but I think this leads me to questions about, given that entanglement is, is omnipresent, understanding the characteristics that, of entanglement that make it more or less damaging. You know, if this is a fact of the world, um, there are areas where it's relatively damaging and rel areas where it's not. And so I think probing the dynamics of the nonprofit sector can, can open up some, um, some, some good avenues for thinking about those sorts of questions. Uh, but I'll stop there, um, and I welcome any, any comments or questions any of you may have on the paper.
Um, I could break the silence. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. This, thanks, Are Tony. Doing... Sorry, I actually was talking. You just couldn't hear me because I forgot about the mute. Ah, um, okay. So, uh, to recap, thanks, uh, Meg, for for the great presentation. Um, and thank you all for uh, for participating. I see that uh, Josh uh, has a question, and then Tony. And so let me make a queue, right? I will make a queue, sort of the traditional way. So that's uh, Josh, Tony, whom I rudely interrupted just a moment ago. Dick. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Who else? Let me see. I'm playing with those view standards. How do I make it bigger? on my screen so i see you all Just maybe there. remove the slides okay um oh, do you want me to i can turn my slides off so you can see the full set of people yeah. is that going to be better uh, i no longer see your site what i want is okay so let's see I, so i don't miss anyone i have josh the tony dick and nathan okay nathan uh, okay Na you if you look at the participants uh, list, the hands come up in order in which they came up. So okay. that keeps that, it easy for you. Where is the, oh, participants list. Okay, that's here. Okay. Well, on my list. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. I will follow that. Thank you, Tony. So, and you're the first then. So we'll start with Tony, then Josh, Dick, Nate, and Lenor. Lenor has a question too. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Useful trick. Uh, no, no problem. Learned that over several months of doing this stuff. Um, love the presentation. I've been so excited about talking about this paper for the last month that I even, when it was originally scheduled, came a week early and was sitting in the room and nobody showed up. Um, and then, <laughs> then it was, um, so I haven't read it in a month, but I had some comments. And um, I, I want to get to the issue of the price mechanisms in the non-governmental sector and bring to bear another possible case study in the nonprofit area that you might be overlooking, and that's um, the religious sector, which is also a nonprofit sector. Now, I don't, Marta, could you allow me to share a slide? Sure. So uh, you should be able to do that because I have it. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen here. And um, what you can see is I, I did two, um, two different groups here. We have the traditional NGO um, group, which when I talk about nonprofits, my students usually think about. This is the Red Cross or the Sierra Club or something like that, where you have a bunch of donors and they make donations to the Red Cross headquarters. And then they have a big bureaucracy that which takes everything out and provides good deeds. And again, there's a credence goods issue here. As a donor, do I know that the Red Cross is going to be doing all these really great things for these charitable recipients? Uh, it's hard for me to determine because the measurement of the outcomes is ambiguous. So oftentimes I can't see it, so I have to trust them. There might be some weak commercial or some weak price mechanism returns because they give you some stuff back. They, you can get a nice calendar with the Sierra Club or something like that. When I was reading this paper, my mind is exploding, especially when you said credence goods. It says, well, I know this one place that does credence goods and they do operate in a, in a market way that they do get these price signals. And these are religions. So religions do a lot of good things for their non parishioners They go out and do a lot of charitable acts, just like the Red Cross and Sierra Club and all those other folks do. But first and foremost, religions are in the business of selling uh, a credence good, the great philosophical answers to life. Why, why are we here? Where are we going to die? And they get payment in return. And people basically pay for this in tithing. I know my students, they always say, you know, uh, Professor Gill, churches aren't really businesses because people give their money freely. And I go, no, it's still an exchange, right? Just because there's not a menu price up there, there's a suggested price, 10% of your income or whatever it might be. Um, the exchange still occurs. And what's really kind of cool about the religious community civil so uh, society model is that the, the, the people who actually have a stake in the organization are the ones providing the welfare, oftentimes the ones receiving the welfare. And there's a lot more local knowledge about what's working and what's not working. 
these parishioners too also help out with you know the other charitable thing they do clothing drives and soup kitchens and all this kind of stuff and for in that kind of situation you seem to have a lot more um price signals going on um and so i i would like you to consider um thinking about that um otherwise i'll think about it too that that's fine by me um and then when it comes to entanglement stuff uh, as you were talking about this today, Europe is a great example where um, the government has become more, more entangled in the religious economy than, than here in the United States. So you get some variation. In fact, a lot of European countries use the religious sector to deliver social welfare, but the churches don't necessarily have to receive that, that signal, the, the quote unquote price signal or the, uh, the market signals back from their parishioners and, and they don't care, right? As Smith talked about this a little bit in, in book five um, that, you know, all these people, it's like, oh, we get a lot of money from the government. We'll go help people. That's great. You know, we're clergy, we're employed. We don't really have to give a damn about what the parishioners are saying because, you know, we're, we, we're intermeshed with the government. So I don't know, just a lot of thoughts about that and I will leave it there. Because I talk to you. Absolutely. All right, Meg, do you want to respond? Uh, no, I mean, there's there's a lot there to think about. That's that's a great a great example that I'm I'm very unfamiliar with, but I think is something certainly worth looking into for for this discussion. All right, and uh, so on my participants list, uh, Josh is uh, Josh is next. Sure, uh, that was a fantastic presentation. I am uh, just thrilled, and I learned a lot uh, from. Uh, reading the paper and from the presentation. So thanks for that. Um, similar to uh, Professor Gill, I'm going to pile on uh, more things that you might think about. Um, I'm interested in uh, hearing your thoughts on how a mutual aid society uh, might be uh, different as well. Um, Emily Chamley Wright's actually got a, a good example, in my opinion. Um, she talks about um, the Marounds is what they called it, uh, M.A. Rounds. And um, it was similar to uh, the Grameen Bank, um, but it was rather a, uh, a lending um, service that uh, female entrepreneurs used uh, where they all contributed, but then were able to help each other out when uh, they needed loans. And so, um, you know, that's got a whole different system because the people that are participating in the mutual aid are um, actually the recipients and the donors. And so I'd be interested. Uh, yes, and uh, Professor Gill's totally right um, that uh, religious congregations could also be uh, considered mutual aid societies. Although I think it is different than the graph you showed in a key way that um, you were showing there are often people that are outside of the society that are beneficiaries. And um, like the example that I pointed out, uh, all the people are, the beneficiaries are the donors. And so uh, I think that could also add an interesting wrinkle um, to how the uh, institutions work. Do you have any thoughts on that? I would be fascinated in hearing um, what you think. Yeah, that's that's great. I wrote like a long time ago some stuff on on mutual aid societies, um, like back in my dissertation days, and, and haven't really returned to it since. And so that hasn't been top of my mind. But that's a great, great example, um, and and something that would be really worth incorporating because the cultivation of local knowledge is done by the people who are benefiting from you know from the the sort of funds of the mutual aid societies. And so that's that's really a cool example, and and I like. You know, pulling that back to, to Tony Gill's religious congregations um, are, are mutual aid society, being mutual aid societies in some ways, although, as you know, without the sort of spillover effects um, in, in, in some of them. But I think that's a great, um, if we're thinking about a whole ecology of enterprises, and this is the thing that I'm having sort of difficulty thinking through, or just need to do some, some heavier thinking through of what makes some organizations relatively more effective? And I like Cham, I'm very, very um, influenced by, by Chamley Wright, as you saw in the, the paper there, but um, you know, having that, that ability to cultivate local knowledge and engage in, in non-monetary discovery. And if we're looking at mutual aid societies, the ability to cultivate local knowledge is like essentially perfect 
Um, you know, there's still some interpretation that has to occur, but, uh, and then engage, their incentives to engage in mo non-monetary discovery are really, really strong. And so I like that idea a lot um, and, and need to, to think more in, I, I need to think a lot more about the ecology of enterprises, but I hadn't really thought about mutual aid societies in a while. And that's a, a great, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think that's, that's a really strong thing to think about in this context. Thank you. All right, uh, next up we have Dick, please. Yeah, Meg, I'd like to raise a kind of a two-part theoretical uh, question. I came to me by virtue and consequence of reading your paper at first and then listening to your discussion today. And the first part is I found myself wondering whether entangled political economy might be really modern socialism. That is to say, there never was a real socialism. I mean, um, Marx was a, was a fraud in the sense that he wanted to abolish all production for markets. And uh, that as Paul Craig Roberts explained in his Virginia dissertation about 1970, the Soviet Union was never a, a uh, planned economy in the Marxist sense but rather it was an economy that was very much designed so that communist party officials could ride around in Mercedes Benz's and they could have a sufficient army uh, to subjugate uh, their territories. And, uh, but beyond that, it, the idea of genuine communism is just impossible. There's going to have to be things like markets and stuff always. Mm -hmm. And so if you start from there, I found myself really intrigued by two of your uh, conceptualizations. Uh, one's in your title, it's that the beyond markets and governments, you're trying to get outside of that dichotomy, which I think that dichotomy is a piece of teleology that I don't think belongs in social science. I think individuals have tele teleology, but life or sciences don't so far as anyone knows. So uh, if it's beyond markets and governments, then you refer to ecologies of enterprises or that kind of a concept. And then I'm thinking if you go from there, uh, no communism uh, and you have ecologies of enterprises, what is this object we call society? Now, most of our writings, texts, theories, all constitute a society as some kind of orderly unity, more or less. And what if you were to think of it as not as, you might, something that would be smooth, continuous, twice differentiable, like a, a ball or something. And what if you were to conceptualize it as like a whole set of, like, like you try, might try to imagine walking across a uh, ice in the far north uh, uh, where the ground is frozen, it's jagged, there's no smooth going. Uh, and in which case enterprises are all, when you talk about enterprise action, one other thing that I think is consistent with your paper is enterprise actions are surely responsive to the executives who direct those enterprises. Mm -hmm. And so that would suggest then I think that uh, relations between nonprofits, public enterprises, market enterprises, is very much going to depend on what executives those enterprises are trying to accomplish. And I think one thing we know uh, when you get in touch with politics and so forth and uh, Kriegman's goods is that things are never what people say they are. I think, I mean, in the sense that uh, uh, 
statements that politicians make, uh, executives for nonprofit agencies, and even these days, profit-seeking agencies, no one very much says we're, we're trying to uh, maximize enterprise wealth. I mean, almost all executives now are turning away. We know they don't use the language of shareholders anymore. They are stockholders. They, they embrace the language of stakeholders. And that uh, spreads out. So it means as a corporate executive, you're not uh, an, a uh, responsible just to the interest of the people who invested in the corporation, but you're responsible to anyone who thinks they have an interest in what the corporation is, is doing or is about, mm -hmm. which uh, I, mean, I guess what I'm getting at is I think that if there is no such thing as a single uniform way in which societies are organized, that is not the life that we observe in what we're talking about with entanglement is a life of what is going on in all of our activities is this continual contestation to use an Ostromian uh, theme in terms of how we are all going to live our lives together because we have to live together. It's a small world. And so we are going to have to live together. Uh, but how? And that question of how and who is going to make those determinations. I think those are very much sort of the big nature of the game that is going on. And uh, you know, so that's why I think in, you can well imagine that there, yeah, there are just, you know, th these are controversial contestations. Mm -hmm. And probably, you know, I have no doubt that there are some nonprofit agencies that are up to no good, just as there are plenty of government agencies up to no good. And a good, good number of private corporations, I would say, are up to no good too. Uh, but that no good versus good dichotomy, I'm increasingly coming to think, isn't something that maps onto a private public a dichotomy, but there's something beneath that, or beyond. Why well, there's more to that beyond markets and government, in, in your title, I think, uh, uh, because so much, us, you know, are, are inclined to say, well, okay, markets good, government's bad, and uh, you know, maybe two centuries ago that might have been so. Oh, well, you know. Uh, there's a lovely book, by, the guy's been dead for a long time now, uh, Jonathan Hughes, uh, uh, called, called The Governmental Habit. Mm -hmm. The Governmental Habit, and what the theme of that book is, go back to colonial America, and there was governmental involvement everywhere, but it was more local. You didn't have national governmental involvement, but you had local governments, or, you know, he had local governments that tell you that, uh, if you had to drive your wagon across a train, you had to have a lantern out and all this sort of stuff, uh, regulations everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, humans are nosy creatures and uh, there's almost something in our natures that are gonna want to look in other people's business. I think almost I sometimes think the idea of a classical liberal motif of you mind your business, you mind your, we all mind our own businesses and things that we life well, you know, has, has probably never uh, fit humanity anyway. But uh, so I, I like this entanglement motif and I think in, in what you're uh, about, I think what you're, what you're really, I think, concerned with, I don't put words in your mouth, but what you're really, I think, moving towards is there's no such thing as givenness. In, in social life. And so what you're going, observing is continual flows and contestations over what the domains of different people and organizations are going to be. And after all, we are biological higher mammals uh, uh, contesting for space. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, you, you've, you've got a really nice, interesting uh, way of going about that. I don't want to confuse you too much, but I got, you, you got me really uh, interested and excited in uh, 
reading what you did and listening to you today. Awesome. Yeah, as, as usual, you've given me just a whole, whole bunch to think about. Um, I, I think one reason why I was, I don't have great responses to most of what you said there because I need to digest it a little more. Uh, but, you know, one reason I really tried to focus on this question of what makes some organizations relatively more effective than others instead of looking at private, close to private as being effective versus close to the public end of the spectrum as being ineffective is because I think you're, you're exactly right. That that's, that's just not perhaps the, it maybe used to be a, a better approximation of reality. But as you said, even, you know, that you mentioned that Jonathan Hughes spoke to me a, a long time ago, and I absolutely love that book um, because you're, you're right. It, it does sort of um, you know, cast doubt on this idea that there was some point in time in the past when entanglement wasn't an issue. It's just entanglement has probably moved from being, you know, more localized to more at the federal, you know, state and then more at the federal level. It's just a moving target of where the entanglement is. Uh, and so I think focusing on you know, Ostrom calls them, you know, design character. It's not the word that she uses. I'm, I'm blanking right now. But if we're looking at the design principles, rather than looking at if it's close to public, if it's good, it's, it's close to private, it's bad. I think sort of more, more clearly thinking through what makes some organizations more effective and shedding the idea that private automatically is going to get you closer to that more effective world. Um, I, I think is going to be important moving forward here. Um, and and I, I like your your idea and, and, and you know you mentioned sort of the um, you know the, the Friedman idea and, and how Friedman's been interpreted in the 15 you know 50 plus years since since his piece was written. you know it's it's amazing to me. I assigned this this article that the, the 1970 whatever it was article um, to a bunch of MBA students. And all they could talk about was corporate social responsibility, corporate social responsibility, like somewhere this is being pounded into their heads. Uh, and, and it's kind of that, that really, really got my, my brain going in the direction of, okay, so there's clearly something going on in private sector organizations as well that is likely to be problematic, is likely to make some organizations that outwardly sound like they're doing great things for society less effective to their target populations. Uh, you know, the students were bringing all sorts of corporate responsibility program, corporate social responsibility programs up to me. And, you know, the, the question I, I didn't want to, you know, I, I'm careful not to, to play my hand too much in, in my MBA class. Uh, and, and uh, but uh, I, I, I just kept thinking, you know, are these programs you're talking about really doing the things they they couldn't possibly be as effective as your company is making them sound um they sound like they're doing really good things they're probably attracting you know some shareholders because they sound really good but they're credence goods there's no way to determine whether these these um you know programs that are coming from the private sector are really doing the good that we want to see in the world uh and and so you know if as I said, you know, thinking about this in an entangled framework, we tend so, or at least I tend often to still be in the mindset of entanglement of these organizations with the public sector. Um, but as you mentioned, I, I think entanglement of these, these uh, uh, nonprofit organizations with the private sector, in some cases is equally problematic. And so thinking through, instead of public, private, thinking through what makes some organizations more effective for the target populations they're trying to serve, I think is going to be be a big question, and, and I see you know Lenore mentioned um, you know Mauricio Miller, the alternative. I absolutely love that book, and I think maybe what what I I would kind of like to do, and and with the the sort of case study section of the paper is look at um, you know maybe uh, the the Red Cross and its entanglement with. Uh, with government organizations, look at some sort of a, an entanglement of a, I, I don't know an organization, um, with private sector, one of these corporate social responsibility initiatives, and then talk about, you know, what like Mauricio Miller is doing and how he's really focusing on the target populations. How do I cultivate that local knowledge? How do I empower people to, uh, you know, really be effective themselves in, in providing these sorts of services? Um, and so, 
I, I don't know if that's a great response to anything that you just said, um, but uh, but that's kind of kind of where my brain is going. Marvelous. Excellent. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Nathaniel Snow. Thank you. Um, fabulous paper. I'm very interested in what you're doing here. Um, I have some some ideas. Uh, first of all, when when trying to establish the efficiency of a nonprofit, we have to first identify what the ends of that nonprofit are. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't we can't exogenously uh, impose some measure of efficiency on a nonprofit without getting into what are the reasons why that nonprofit comes to exist. Mm -hmm. The next thought that I have would be that um, nonprofits often emerge uh, from within informal social networks. So within, within groups that have goals of their own uh, that are embodied in what I've come to call the repertoire of that group, which is a sort of a tacit social contract contract that the members of any informal organization have. And the, the funny thing about an informal group is that there's nobody in charge. There's no decision maker. There's no locus of decision making. Instead, all decisions are directed by the shared constitution of that group that is embedded in the way that they talk with each other. So in your problem of trying to identify the, the rational calculation that a nonprofit has to try to do, we would have to try to identify what the, the unit of exchange is, or not necessarily the unit, but the medium mm -hmm. of exchange in those contexts. And, and, I, and I, I wanna offer a hypothesis that the medium of exchange is sympathy in, in the Smithian sense, and, um, and maybe look at uh, Vernon Smith and Bart Wilson's new book about uh, based on the theory of moral sentiments and how sympathies are the way that we exchange approbation and disapprobation for certain kinds of activities. And if you can, if you can think about a nonprofit as as formalization of some portion of an informal group's repertoire, it can be done for two reasons. One can be as a mechanism of specialization that then leads to more efficient accomplishment of the goals of that group from within the group. But it can also be rent seeking in the same way that a firm can be a rent seeking group, that it can be trying to expropriate some portion of that group's tacit social contract, that repertoire, in order to, um, in order to, to expropriate it and capture rents from it. So, so we can see uh, nonprofit groups engaging both as specialized entities within uh, within activities to try to accomplish shared social goals, but we can also see them acting the way that, that Wagner and, and, and Habert talk about um, parties expropriating symbols and images in order to capture their own rents in that context. Um, and so the, 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 the question here is uh, what, maybe that sympathy can be used as the tool for that calculation. Um, then, then the other question is whether it's more related to the to the commercial or more related to the to the government, where where a nonprofit lands. Mm -hmm. If we understand a formalized nonprofit as being within this informal context, as being like a Kosian firm, right? That that does have an entity that can make decisions on behalf of of some portion of that group. Then that decision maker does engage in exchanges, both in market exchanges and in government and political exchanges. Mm -hmm. The location on the spectrum between you know, public and private has to do with which kinds of exchanges that nonprofit is engaged in more often mm -hmm. um, than, than the other kind of exchanges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what you can do with all that, but I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all very interesting. And, and sort of your comment coupled with a couple of the previous comments make me think that I need to sort of flesh out the, the, the word that I'm looking for, like the institutional characteristics of nonprofits really matter. Like if we think about like uh, personalities, political personalities matter more in governments when the institutions are, are really weak. When the institutions are really strong, 
then then you know certain charismatic political leaders are are able to exert less influence. And so I would think the same would be relatively true in in nonprofits that the the uh, you know nonprofit CEO or president would be able to, to get away with some malfeasance if the, the organization is, you know, thought of as being his organization, then if there are strong sort of institutional constraints on the head of the organization itself. Um, so, so your conversation or, or your comments coupled with a few of the previous others make me think that I need to, to flesh out that idea a little bit more as well. I need to think a little bit more on your, your sympathy as the, the medium of exchange point. Um, because my, my worry there, and, and maybe I'm just not thinking about sympathy, the, the correct definition of sympathy is that, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it seems like the problem that you would run into is that uh, uh, it works better for credence goods and less well for experienced goods if the medium of exchange is sympathy. Uh, and so I, I need to think through that a little bit further, though. Awesome comments, though. Thank well, you. And, and, and if I may briefly, in terms of strong institution versus weak institution, uh, consider what you were actually describing as hierarchical as compared to egalitarian, because you can have a very strong institution led by a charismatic leader. Sure. Yes, that's so, fair. So conservative. Yeah. Absolutely. Still trouble with the muting, muting. Uh, Lenore, you're next, please. Okay, thank you all for um, this uh, stimulating conversation. And Meg, thanks for, you know, pulling the paper together that did it. I, Ashley Rooney's sitting over here watching me, you know, with glee because for months and months and months, I've been saying, we're going to get there through the Entangled Political Economy Group because they're thinking about it differently. But I'm going to challenge you all. And I, I feel like the grandmother of this literature. So just bear with me for a second. Um, I'm going to challenge you all a little bit to think even you know, deeper with what Dick sort of laid on the ground for us on some ways is that, and, and this came from Tony's little diagram where he was talking to you know, modeling the church and the third party payer system and what's coming out of that is welfare. I'm gonna challenge you all on that. I don't think we can get there talking in the language of welfare economics. We may need to learn how to translate things back so we can talk to people who can't get off that paradigm, but we need a fundamental ground shift here. So I'm going to say that I think what we really need to be going for, and I've started playing with this language a little bit, is that we need more of a Mingarian theory of social assistance against this, you know, Walrasian other kind of model, you know, how Dick does, gives us the two models. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to go deep into the, you know, what does a Mingarian world really look like in this space? And a Mingarian world of social assistance, um, where we're not talking about welfare in that sense, but we're talking about social assistance as a realm of human action that, you know, where we get people with plans doing stuff, as Tony kind of puts it, but that gets us into a really interesting world where we've got to go to Lachman and the heterogeneity of capital, if I can say that word, and the heterogeneity of plans. I mean, we've got to go there. That's how you get an ecology, and that's how you select the right model to fit the right goal. So Meg, I love that you're starting with effectiveness as a question. Um, I think there are two sub questions to that question. Um, and again, this gets us away from this broader kind of macro welfare concept, but it's the, the question of effect and effectiveness is, should always ask for whom, and it should always ask the Lockean question, who judges? Who gets to decide if it was effective? And we're grappling a lot with those questions right now. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a huge, huge, you know, institutional evaluation industry in the nonprofit world trying to grapple with these questions. And there's almost zero theoretical framing for saying it's the dynamic world. <laughs> and we, you know, anything they want to model with RCTs and all kinds of other tools that are being brought into this space are only going to give us static pictures. You know, they're not going to model it like pricing. And so I think that um, if we really get into a Mingarian philosophy of social assistance and think about it that way, we don't get stuck on the calculation problem so much as we get stuck on, you know, these other kinds of models of what's the knowledge that's being produced. And so I would really commend to you reading the Martin Burt book that I recommended as well. I think he's on to something very interesting. Um, we've been doing a little model about the knowledge flow in the sector. 
And the challenge with the two examples that Emily gives are that the donors have, you know, nonprofits are responding to donor incentives and reputational incentives. And the reputational incentives are a subset of donor incentives, pretty, you know, looking at the donors, essentially. What happens if you try to take the knowledge of the people you're trying to help and, and treat them as if they are a consumer and capable of rational action, and you try to get that knowledge into that knowledge flow section? That's a really fundamental empirical problem or a practical problem that we need to work on in that regard. Um, so anyway, I'd love to talk to you some more about where we're going with a lot of these things. Um, I want to do some seminars. I think we need some books. Those of you who are working on nonprofit topics, please you know, send me ideas about what you're doing. We'll figure out how to support it, get it published. Um, there's a great Tulloch essay, which you need to look at, um, which is called Information Without Profit. And I think it, it addresses some of these questions that y'all are talking about. Uh, Mal Nair uncovered that article, and Mal's got an interesting working paper on trying to pull the robust political economy concepts here into the space as well. So if you haven't talked to Mal lately, I can get you a copy of the draft, but she may have a new iteration. So I would talk to Mal about her paper because she's chasing down a lot of similar things, and she's done some great legwork on literature. So there is a little bit of older literature we can get to to map against some of these questions. So anyway, that's a big brain dump, but um, I'm just gonna challenge you. We've gotta go deeper. We've gotta think more broadly about social assistance because that's where we get the Tocquevillian questions into play. You know, Tocqueville wasn't talking about welfare. He was talking about how do we help one another? That is a form of human action, I have argued, and we haven't modeled it at all. Yeah, this is, this is all great feedback. I, I actually met Mal at a, a thing that you put on a couple years ago. Um, so yeah, she's, she's fantastic. Um, so I will absolutely, absolutely reach out to her on this. I mean, you've given me a lot to think about. I think you're absolutely right. And, and this, this Mingarian sort of framework is, is really, really interesting because that's a huge trouble that I was confronting in, in even writing this up is just the language that I was using didn't seem to fit with what I was wanting to say. Um, and so thinking through it from a Mingarian framework, I think is really, really helpful. Um, and that's, that's, that's fantastic because that's exactly, exactly the issue that I was, I was confronting here. So awesome, thank you. Okay, and uh, we have a question from Roger. Okay, am I mute? No, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay we have a question from Roger and I actually do have a question. Somehow the host can raise hand, so I'm raising my hand for after. <laughs> For after Roger, uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, let me lower my hand. Um, yeah, Meg, if you had any, uh, yeah, congratulations. If you had any doubts about the value of this mm -hmm. effort, they've been blown out of the water by now. Everybody's giving you a brain dump, and that was all crazy. So congratulations. That's that means you really did something. Um, you need examples, I think. Uh, you know you insisted more than once in the talk you know oh i'm just laying the groundwork you know yeah it's it's this is hard work and everything so i appreciate that and so as you know you need examples david lucas the syracuse university entrepreneurship department also a student of chris coin has this great work on homelessness yeah and 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 that's got this total you know entangled dimension to it and everything so i think that would be a real helpful example actually um a, a word that I don't think I've heard you use, and forgive me if I just missed it, but a word I don't think I heard you use regarding like what makes a charitable or you know civic service uh, uh, society organization sort of more able to calculate and what less competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so Tony had the example of of the church, but it's a whole different thing if you're like in North America where there's competition among the religions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or you know late medieval Italy where there wasn't, right? So, so you know, so you're, you of course, everybody, we all, everybody in the call probably knows, you know, the Smith quote about candor and modesty, you know, when you have competition among the religions, it tends to produce candor and uh, modesty. So, you know, I, it, it, it's how do you extract the local knowledge? Uh, how do you add value? These are, um, we don't know. It's an entrepreneurial discovery process, and so you need competition to to you know enable that entrepreneurial discovery process within uh, the philanthropic sector. Uh, one last final comment. Um, uh, you know, this whole thing about corporations keeps coming up, and uh, um, 
stakeholder versus shareholder and everything. I think we need to sort of face up to the fact that the that you know Manny's market for corporate control is gone. It's dead. There is no market for corporate control. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but it's been it's been it's more abundant. I don't think it's exaggerating to say that it is more abundant. There's an article. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, put the thing in the chat, the site by Vitaly and others where she really shows, you know, one corporation owns the other corporation owns the other, they all own each other, right? So, so there's no human set of stockholders that can exercise any kind of discipline on these firms. Mm -hmm. So they really become an independent autonomous power very much as Hayek feared back in 1960. So, so I think that changes some of how we think about stakeholder stock, stockholder and uh, private public and so on. So, so that's it, that's all I got to say. Congratulations again. Awesome. This is this is all very very good feedback. Um, yeah, the 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 market for corporate control. I mean, that's that's another yeah huge concern that I that's a, that pushes the concern back to another level. Um, you know, I'm, I'm already concerned about these corporate social responsibility type programs, but if the fact is that these are all you know. I don't know, variations on a theme of, of, of different sorts of the, the same organization, just in different iterations. That makes the problem, it makes it even more problematic. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously coming from George Mason, I'm very tempted to be like, rah, rah, markets. Um, but but <laughs> these problems in markets, um, I, I don't want to ignore those, like talking about where markets work well versus where there are legitimate problems in markets is important for supporting uh, sort of discussion about markets more broadly. Um, I, I think, you know, your, your discussion of competition absolutely is the case. I, I love bringing that in back to the religious, um, the religious point there. And then, yeah, David Lucas, I, I overlapped with him at Mason. I remember seeing this, this, these pieces on homelessness and just this is why I love these sorts of, you know, discussions is because I completely had forgotten about that, that whole set of stuff that he had written. So great, great suggestions. Thank you. The, the, the site's now in the comments to the Vitaly thing. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So I want to ask um, a little bit about the, um, this notion that comes from Dick's work of voluntary versus, uh, versus forced investors. Uh, I have a paper on taxonomy of entrepreneurship arguing that the only meaningful distinction of entrepreneurship is, uh, is it supported with forced investors? So taxpayers or you know, some, some, way, some other way of basically forcing people to, to pay uh, for the enterprise or is it voluntary investors, right? And all the other types of entrepreneurship like social entrepreneurship, for-profit, non-profit, I think they're meaningless unless you look at the voluntary versus forced investors. And I think this, it kind of, it might be helpful to your paper, even though you have many directions and many ideas here, but uh, it might in, to some extent be helpful here because it gets us at the distinction between different types of nonprofits. So how is an HOA different from a university versus Planned Parenthood, right? Like very, all of them are nonprofit or Google Foundation, yet another type of a nonprofit, right? Well, an HOA, it's mostly voluntary, uh, support, right? If um, if an HOA, so the home own, homeowners association, if they want to do vanity projects, or if they get too corrupt in our awarding co contracts, right? If they get too crony in that regard, um, the um, the members of the association refuse to pay higher fees, right? So so there is that policing, that principal agent uh, relationship that is pretty tight. But if you look at um, at something like Planned Parenthood, where they get fifty percent of their support from the government or a university, right? University will have a like very diverse sources of, of funding, right? So the university will have the tuition, which is also sort of forced invest, investment, right? Through all the support that students get through student loans, but, um, but all the other different types of funding, they will have, um, they will behave differently than an HOA, right? So anyway, I, uh, I think that that's, that's helpful. And with that, I also think like uh, this social corporate social uh, responsibility, if you think about Google Foundation, right? Like why does Google start the foundation? Well, maybe they just are very altruistic and good people, possible. But maybe also it's a way of not paying taxes on marketing dollars, right? Like, so that's actually a forced investor right like it's basically in, indulging in some vanity projects uh with your pre-tax pre-tax dollars so anyway just random thoughts really <laughs> yeah that's this is all great um i i i 
need to look at that paper because that that sounds very very relevant here. I mean, the one one fabulous thing about these sorts of conversations as well is this doesn't have to be just one paper anymore. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, I think no. I've got a couple of different directions that I could could take this, and I, I can. Um, kind of view this as maybe splitting into at least two papers based on the feedback today, or one very, very long paper um, that nowhere would publish uh, and no one would finish reading. Um, but, uh, I see Roger saying in the chat, you have a research program and that's my fault. Uh, exactly. You, yeah. If you want to pursue this, this is a research program because it's basically a different way of looking at the different organizations. So. Yeah, this has, been, this has been so, so helpful. Thank you everyone for, for the feedback. Um, this has been, been fabulous. Yeah, well, thank you uh, everyone for coming online today and taking the time out of your busy, uh, busy days. Uh, if you're at uh, Public Choice Meetings uh, next week, uh, I hope to see you there. Uh, and uh, we will be meeting in two weeks because this was rescheduled uh, for my presentation, right? So uh, I, I hope to see you all there as well. Uh, thank you for today. And yeah, see you in, in two weeks. Thanks. Thank you, Meg. Great, thank great you. work. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay.